Tracy Profiler version 0.7 is now available for general use, bringing many new features, improvements, bug fixes and optimizations. For example, you can now dock the profiler windows as you like to improve your workflow. You will be also happy to know that the source view window has been re-implemented from scratch and will now always display the line you want to go to. Source files are now cached during profiling run, if possible, and saved in the trace file. But let's get to the interesting stuff. Here we can see a time range during which some things happen. There is some instrumentation here and we can try to infer where we are from that, but there is a better way to do this. You see, Tracy is now a hybrid profiler, capable of automatically sampling your program execution. Here are the collected data points, showing you the call stack at regular intervals. This data is captured automatically if the profiled application is executing with elevated privileges. Currently this is only available on Windows, with Linux support to follow in the future. To make more sense out of this, you can click on the ghost icon to switch to ghost zones display mode. This will graph the functions present in sampled call stacks on the timeline. The dark zones represent inline function calls, or rather, function return locations, which are subject to compiler optimizations, as described in the manual. Be aware of the sampling limitations, though. Here we can see a large ghost zone representing a call to the A star function. Switching back to the instrumentation mode reveals that in reality there are multiple smaller calls to this function. This discrepancy is caused by sampling frequency limits and by having no way to know when the function is entered and returned from. Now, let's take a step back for a brief moment. Here we have zone info window, representing a virtual instrumentation context. From this window we can open the source file view, which uses associated source location data to identify the appropriate source file and line to display. Things are different in case of call stack frames, which represent a specific place in the program code. Opening the source view by clicking the right mouse button will now instead open the symbol view window, which uses the specific location data to retrieve and disassemble machine code. This window operates in context of a whole symbol, which may consist of multiple inline functions and many different source files. This drop-down list contains all the inline functions which were used to construct the machine code. And here you can see all the source files which can be associated with assembly instructions in the symbol. You can switch to another source file at any moment. Some source lines will have a marker showing how many assembly instructions were generated from this line. This is only as accurate as the debugging information and sometimes may be misleading, for example, due to how compiler may unroll a loop. Clicking on the source line will highlight the corresponding assembly instructions. Likewise, clicking on the source location of the assembly instruction will highlight the source code line. This of course also works across different source files. Do note that each source file has its own associated color key. The relative locations option changes the absolute code address to an offset within the symbol. The source location option may be used to hide source locations of assembly lines. Use the machine code option to display the raw bytes of the assembly instructions. And the jumps option can disable display of jump arrows in the code. Following these arrows will help you understand how the code behaves. Clicking on any arrow will focus the assembly view on the jump target location. Note that some jump targets may have more than one jump source location. Selecting the appropriate display mode allows you to disable the assembly view, disable the source file view, or show them both next to each other. Each jump in addition to the jump arrow will also display jump location, in this case, both as a jump label L14 and as a symbol name with offset. Clicking on the symbol name will perform the jump. Notice that the target location has L14 label as a comment. Some jumps go to other symbols, here indicated by a lack of arrow next to the symbol name. This makes no difference, as clicking on the name will just go to the appropriate symbol. To display all captured symbols, go to the statistics menu, where you will find the instrumented zones list just like before, but also a new list of symbols. Each symbol has a base function name, and also a list of functions which were inline expanded within. A count of inline functions is displayed in parentheses next to the symbol name. 
Alternatively, you may disable grouping by symbol and display just a list of function names. In this case inline functions show their parent symbol in parenthesis. Do note that each entry on the list also contains the executable image name and its code size. Ok, now let's get back to the sampling. This is a capture of non-instrumented ETC pack, performing a benchmark of texture compression, repeated 9 times. Just by relying on sampling you can see what is happening here. In the statistics menu there are no instrumented zones, but we can go to the sampling section. Notice that each symbol now has a time measurement. Also, the inline functions list is now much more complete, due to random spread of samples across symbols. Some inline functions are displayed more than once, which is normal, as each entry is a separate inline expansion in the symbol code. Clicking on the symbol entry will open the call stack sample parents window, which shows the code paths which lead to the selected symbol, sorted by time usage. It should be noted that this time is only an approximation, based on sampling frequency and number of counted samples. The distinct code paths can be browsed using the arrow buttons. When the sampling data has been collected, the symbol view will display sample count statistics. Additionally, each source and assembly line has its own associated sample count, which is also displayed as a heat map on the scroll bars. Let's go to one of the hot places. Here you can see sample statistics for each source line. In addition to the percent value, each entry is also color-coded, to make the outstanding ones easier to find. Clicking on the line will show the corresponding assembly code and its sample counts. To see a sum of samples in multiple lines, click on the count value, holding the control key to select multiple entries. Holding the shift key will select a range. The results are displayed at the bottom of the pane. The counted samples may be distributed among many source files. You can see how much each file contributes to the total value on the list of source files. The same can be applied to each contributing inline function. To see only the samples from the selected function, enable the function checkbox to the left. Notice how the samples have now disappeared and that there are grayed out entries on the scroll bars. Let's now go to a hot spot in this function. And now let's change the selected function. As you can see, the previously present samples are now hidden, and only the samples corresponding to the new function are displayed. But why is this one line taking so much time? Let's investigate. Here you can see the microarchitectural data for the CPU the code was running on. It would seem that the vpermq instruction is not that fast to execute, and there are two of them next to each other. This may be the reason. The data presented here is briefly described in the manual, and further study might be needed to fully understand its meaning. To analyze register dependencies between instructions, you may click on the assembler operand. A color-coded registers list will be then displayed, showing where the registers are being read and where they are being written to. This may give you some basic guidelines about performance problems. To gain more insight, you may use CPU pipeline simulation tools such as LLVMMCA. To do so, you will need to extract the body of a loop. You can do so by right-clicking on the jump arrow and selecting the Save Jump Range option. This will produce a text file with the selected assembly instructions. This file can be passed straight to the LLVMMCA to get the loop execution simulation. Refer to the LLVMMCA manual to understand the data it produces. One of the most interesting things shown here is the visualization of the loop execution on a timeline. The index column shows two numbers. The first is the loop iteration count, and the second is the instruction count in this iteration. We can read from the graph that it takes 16 CPU cycles to go from a dispatch of the first instruction in a loop to a retirement of the last instruction. This shows how much time is needed to execute one iteration of the loop. It is not a whole picture however, as we are executing on an out-of-order CPU. By projecting down the cycle during which the first iteration finishes retirement, we can see that at the time it is done, there are already seven more iterations being concurrently processed by the processor. 
This kind of microarchitectural exploration is critical for achieving the best performance of your program. To match the assembly instructions displayed by the profiler to instruction counts displayed by external utilities, you may click on the address column, which will display instruction counts instead. Right click to revert. OK, now let's see a practical example. The A-star pathfinding algorithm is fairly complex and can be difficult to optimize just by looking at the code. Furthermore, the code execution profile heavily depends on the input parameters. Some cases are extremely simple to handle, while others involve more processing or even more. So, let's see what sampling can tell us about performance problems here. Looking at the assembly heat map, we can see there's one extremely hot place, which has a big impact on the algorithm speed. And here are the assembly instructions, two conditional jumps. Let's see how it looks in the source code. Aha! The comparison operator alone takes almost half of the execution time. Since this is a POD struct, we can replace the two equality checks with one memory comparison, which will eliminate one of the branches in the assembly. Here is the improved code, looking much less readable, but what about its performance? As we can clearly see, this change is certainly a big win. To verify these readings, we should compare the instrumented zone timings with the previous profiling trace. And there you have it. The execution times of the A-star algorithm has been improved with no doubt. You probably have not realized that what we have just done can't be performed in any other profiler. To see why, let's take a quick look at the LZ4 compression algorithm. The base compression function does very little work, in essence it calls an appropriate inline function to do the heavy lifting. Tracy has a unique ability to track sample counts even in inline functions, so that you can see the exact places in the source code, which are the most time intensive. Any such place can be also reliably mapped to the specific assembly instructions it is produced. This data is critical to accurately assess how to improve code performance. Now let's compare this to Intel VTune, the industry standard sampling profiler. As you can see, there are samples only for two lines in the base function, and there's no profiling data for any inline function. And now let's see how the source code is mapped to the assembly. A complete disaster. All the assembly instructions produced by the inline functions have been assigned to a single source line in the dispatch function. This makes it totally impossible to get any value from the obtained results. Well, you may work around that by disabling inline expansion, can't you? Absolutely not. This would completely change how the code is optimized and how it performs. This has been just a quick look at the sampling functionality of the Tracy profiler. More detailed description of this feature, as well as other things that were improved, can be found in the user manual. Do certainly take a look, and you will find some surprises there, for example support for OpenCL profiling, or Z-standard compression for traces. One other thing worth mentioning is the migration of the Tracy source code repository from Bitbucket to GitHub, which provides much better facilities. If you enjoy using Tracy Profiler, consider leaving a tip on GitHub sponsors. It will make the next version even better. Until then, happy profiling.